five photographers and the assignment of a lifetime. A journey into the unknown to the islands around Africa. Over the islands of Africa. Sao Tome and Principe. So that's the plane. Very nice. <laughs> it is, our tournier. Is that my seat? Exactly. You sit here with your seatbelt on. And you can secure your camera with this. Rui Camillo, a German photographer with Portuguese roots, is taking his camera around the West African island republic of Sao Tome and Principe. He charters a propeller plane from Africa's connection to get a bird's eye view for his first exploration of the little country. This is the only plane on Sao Tome suitable for aerial photography. The Portuguese discovered the two uninhabited islands more than 500 years ago and turned them into a gigantic production facility for cocoa and coffee. Thousands of slaves were brought here to carry out the hard work in the tropical heat. In 1975, the country became independent and now attracts visitors with its beautiful beaches. For Rui Camilo, a trip to the former colony is also a journey into Portugal's past and his own history. Word has already gotten around that he's here on the islands. What are you doing on Sao Tomé and Principe? I've always wanted to produce a book on Sao Tomé and Principe. I was born in Portugal. At school, I always heard stories about Sao Tomé. And I've always wanted to come here. I want the book to show the rest of the world how the people here live. Because a lot of people don't know the islands at all. It's very small on the map of the world. And I hope the islands will become better known. For Santo Mians, their country is the center of the world. In the south, the equator and the zero meridian intersect. However, an image of the end of the world also emerges among the old colonial buildings. Cocoa plantations are becoming overgrown. The island republic has only 160,000 inhabitants. More than a third of these live in the capital, Sao Tome. It's busy here but the rhythm of the country is calm and unhurried. This confused me a little at first. You want to do things a bit quicker, but I soon got used to this African sense of time. It's warm at the equator, and I can really understand the people here who want to take things a little easier. It's simply the weather forces you. For a long time, cocoa and chocolate were the gold of Sao Tome and Principe. The Portuguese organized their colonies specifically for exporting the sweet commodity. Today, an Italian immigrant is following up on the old tradition, Claudio Corallo. I was told you make the best chocolate in the world. Yes. And as a chocoholic, I want to start by tasting your chocolate. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> This is 100% cocoa. It's simply ground cocoa beans. Try it. That's chocolate. Pure cocoa, that's all. The taste is strong, but not bitter. 
True, it's not bitter. Bitterness is a defect in cocoa. There is no good bitter chocolate. If this 100% chocolate is not bitter, how can normal chocolate be bitter? But how does chocolate become bitter? It is an error in the production process. Claudio Corallo's chocolate factory is set up in a small wooden house. On just a few square meters, all the work is done by hand. Agricultural engineer Corallo particularly wants to keep the pure cocoa taste. The bitterness of the chocolate can be covered up using sugar, but a bitter aftertaste remains. It works better with milk, which works like an antidote. But those products are processed so much that the taste of the fruit is lost. They contain cocoa, but not its aroma. This is the laboratory we developed in the beginning. And it ended here. Then we had to expand, because the tests were so successful. And now we produce here too. This is a mixture, three different types that we grow ourselves. How long did you have to experiment? My whole life. It's a passion and a life. When you do things without passion, you don't do them well. Sure. I don't really like working, but with this passion, the work is just so much fun. No exaggeration. This is the best chocolate I've ever eaten. Thank you. The best chocolate. I've never tasted 100 or 75 percent chocolate. And never one like this. Very good. This chocolate grows in the fields with the care of a lifetime. I must try another piece. <laughs> Sao Tome is an incredibly fertile island, not just for cocoa. When the Portuguese withdrew in 1975, the land was redistributed. Today, it belongs to small farmers. What you see here is pepper, one of three kinds. I have three kinds. This one is called panure. This here has a slight smell. Yes, and they burn too. They're spicy. <laughs> When they're still green, you can use them to season meat cutlets. <laughs> there are hardly any large production plants left on Sao Tome. Everyone tills their own piece of land. Kervino Espirito Santo studied agriculture in Portugal. His personal favorite is the vanilla plant. It's quite sensitive and requires a lot of attention. This is a vanilla plant. When it's in bloom, you have to pollinate every single flower. If a thousand flowers open, I have to pollinate a thousand flowers. And it has to be very early, before eight in the morning. All by hand. All by hand. Unbelievable. <laughs> no, it's not so unbelievable. It's our job. It's what we live from. That's it, more or less. These are all my children. We have experiences together. But you don't talk to the plants, do you? <laughs> well, the plants do talk. They tell me things. Not like we do. But when they need to, they complain. <laughs> do you need an interpreter, then? 
Right. Someone who understands the language. Real gardeners can do it. Speak vanilla plant. What is it saying? <laughs> it's saying hello. <laughs> Gemino harvested seven kilos this year. He sells the vanilla on the market, and more rarely to tourists. An aromatic souvenir. <laughs> When they dry out, they harden. They need moisture to remain flexible. One of the most beautiful Portuguese cocoa plantations was the Rosa São João. While other Rosas slowly decayed, an enthusiast rebuilt this one with a lot of love. <laughs> Did you have a good trip? Welcome to the Rosa São João. It's lovely here. Yes, it's an integrated development project. We have farming, environmental protection, education, art, culture and tourism. All in the one place, a cultural institution in the country. João Carlos Silva spent many years as a TV chef in Portugal. He takes the traditional Santomian cooking and refines it with influences from all over the world. Cooking is like making art in every culture and every country. And you can mix these together to make different things. May I use my fingers? Of course. The hands reign in the kitchen. They're the king and queen. Sao Tome and Principe were like a huge laboratory in the Atlantic. It was an interim storage facility for slaves and also for cultures. We have to use this to shape the future. We have to reinvent Sao Tome and Principe. Isn't that lovely? It's magical. Wow. It's unbelievably tasty. Rui hasn't just come to eat. He wants to propose a cultural project to Joao. You've told me so much about working with young people. Maybe we could do a photo project with young people. What do you think? For sure. Fantastic. Let's give it a try. The youngsters will definitely love it. I'd be delighted. We could plan an exhibition. Sure, we could do it here or in the town. Then we'll take it down to the village as well. Yes, it would be important for the village community to see it. Exactly. So, do you want to do it? Very much. You sure? <laughs> it's a deal. Hello, I'm Rui, and I welcome you to the photography course. Have you ever taken photos? With a mobile. Ah, with a mobile. Today we'll be using these cameras. With these cameras, you can take much better photos than with mobile phones, because we're going to make an exhibition with your photos. Should they all be in the picture? Whatever you like, it's your photo. That's very nice. You have to press the release button a little harder. Nice. <laughs> Let me see. Ah, you've cut the feet off. Do you see it? You have to press the button for longer. 
bin völlig begeistert von den Kids are really great. Die sind They're really clever, extrem extremely clever, receptive. Extrem They understood everything right away. I really didn't have ich to explain very much, whether about technology or image composition. So you know what you want to photograph? Yes. Yes. Landscapes. Paisages. You want to do Paisages. landscapes, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> People. The beaches. Okay, you do the beaches. <laughs> the savannah. Savannah, savannah. Ah, okay. All right, good luck. Take good photos, okay? <laughs> In two days, the kids are to come back and present their photos. Rui is taking a trip into the island's interior, through the primeval forest. Almost 70% of Sao Tome is covered in forest, and some areas have never been explored by man. Luis Mario Almeida knows the hidden corners of the forest better than anyone. He studied in Cuba, was trainer of the national football team, and founded the Sao Tome Hiking Association. The forest is of enormous significance to us. It used to be a place of refuge, but we're also afraid of it because of many things that have happened there. We have a very complex relationship with the forest. In colonial times, slaves often fled into the forest. Some lived in free communities and fought the Portuguese from here. This tree is like a cathedral for me, a strangler fig. You see how it's grown? There was another tree here that it strangled and killed. A parasite tree. Exactly. It's a pretty parasite. <laughs> Isn't there a danger that it'll kill other trees? Yes, sure. But that's nature, isn't it? The Portuguese tried to tame the primeval forest setting up their plantations there. What a great view. The Obo begins here, our national park. The primeval forest is back there, but this here is cultivated. You see the trees over there with the orange fruit? They're erythrinas, coral trees. These are leguminos. They provide shade for the cocoa and coffee plants. An indigenous tree? No, the Portuguese imported it. Together with the plants, the Portuguese imported their entire culture. Also the architecture, the houses, the architecture, the houses, I know them from Portugal. There are moments when I remember buildings from my childhood, from the countryside where I grew up. Very, very similar. This used to be a bullfighting arena. Bullfighting? Here? Yes, there was in colonial times. Bullfighting is part of the Portuguese culture, and they brought it with them. As a pastime, they made a lot of money with the rosas back then, so they could afford it. 
Did the Santo Mayans carry on this tradition? No, no, Santo Mayans are afraid of big animals. There are none here, are there? No, we've no oxen or horses. I can understand that when you're far from home, you start replicating and rebuilding the things you know from back home. But this must be strange for the people here, to be living in these old buildings from the old regime. Of course, the people who live here now had nothing to do with those colonial times. But when I see this here, it does give me a strange feeling. The photography course with the young people is still going. Over here, everybody. There's a trick for taking really nice photos. You take the photos in the morning or the afternoon. During the day, the light is very strong. The shadows are keen. And at this time now, the colors are stronger and the light is warm. Or how would you put it? Yellower, yes, more yellow. Portraits of people turn out nicer. I don't think they have any fear of failure with the camera. They're not afraid of taking a bad picture. They approach it with total freedom. Because they're not trying to take a great picture, they actually do take great pictures. Everybody everywhere wants to be happy, satisfied. It's something that connects everyone in the world, and here it's no different. We think we're happy in a different way to the people here. But when you enjoy something together, you very quickly enter into a dialogue about the photos we're taking together, and about the friendly communication. Here on the islands, living with water is a matter of course. Two boat builders have invited Rui on a maiden voyage. Their canoe, which they scraped out of a thick tree trunk, has just been completed. Before delivering it to the customer, they're testing its seaworthiness. Many children grow up within sight of the sea. And they quickly learn how to handle the water with skill. On the islands, learning is often based on watching and imitating. Skills are thus passed down from generation to generation. With their handmade rafts of wood and bits of styrofoam, they emulate their parents. At 13, these boys can already do everything a fisherman needs to be able to do, and that includes boat building. You need about 15 to 20 days to learn how to build a boat like this. You go into the forest with the boat builders and watch them for a while. This gives you a rough idea of how it's done. Then you ask if you can help, and you practice a little. And then you more or less grasp it. Exactly. The children already see it. Yes. They learn from an early age how the grown-ups do their work. In two or three years, they'll already be building a boat. Not as big as this, something smaller. Then they go fishing with it, one or two kilometers from the shore. It's really easy. The fishing village of Moropaisha is in the northwest of the island. Behind a fence, sea turtles are brought up that would have had little chance of survival on the beach. 
Animal conservationists collect the eggs and help the little turtles to hatch. Environmental activist Hippolito has been doing this for eight years. We call this our training center. We bring the eggs here and bury them at the same depth at which we found them. You see these blocks of wood? And the numbers? They're marking the spots where eggs are buried. This means, for example, that in sand hole 20, there are 100 eggs. And underneath, you see the date on which they were buried. So we know exactly when they're going to hatch. Their eyes appear to be closed, but they're already open. Shortly before dark, Hippolito takes the hatched turtles to the sea. In the daytime, there are too many enemies on the beach. Under cover of darkness, the little turtles have a better chance of surviving. Hippolyto told me that the number of turtles, the population, has decreased dramatically. Just 10 years ago, for example, he could collect six times as many turtles. If it wasn't for him, the outlook would be pretty bad for the turtles here. Of those that he collects and sets free, perhaps 5% survive. The next day, Rui is waiting for his pupils to return the cameras. But only a few of the participants appear. Does he have a problem now? OK, the others are at a dance right now, something unscheduled that just came up. And that seemed more attractive than returning the cameras. But they're coming later today at around 5. So I'll just start with him and take a look at the photos. I'm very curious about what he's done. The photos this boy took are super. He really made an effort to apply what we talked about yesterday. He went among his family, also photographed strangers, landscapes. And in many, many photos, he showed that he's a very good eye. I'm really surprised. And we could nearly put on a whole exhibition with just him on his own. You've done really good work. They're beautiful photos. You did this very well too, with the grasses all around, and the boy exactly in the middle. He's looking right into the camera. Really lovely photo. That's the first one in the exhibition. I can't wait to see the other photos. It'll be a great exhibition. And you won't be able to tell that it was done by 14-year-olds. Now we're off to the northeast with the propeller plane. 
on to Principe, 160 kilometers across the Gulf of Guinea. At the mini airport of Principe, Rui is met by Carlos, who will be taking him around the island. Good morning. How are you? Nice to meet you. You have a safe trip? Thank you, but I also speak Portuguese. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> Carlos owns one of the few cars on the island. Only 6,000 people live here, and most of them live simple lives. On the bumpy main road, the first stop is Claudio Corallo's cocoa plantation. Terreiro Velho is the name of the Rosa, in English, Old Yard. Rui and Carlos are met by Nick. Claudio Corallo's on-site manager knows all the secrets of cocoa cultivation. I've learned a lot from Claudio. I really like it here, and if you're motivated, you learn a lot. How long have you been here? For 10 years. 10 years? And you like it? Yes, very much. I learn something new every day. These are the plants that we grow. They're from Brazil and they're top quality. They're from Brazil? That's right. They're the best quality we've got. This cocoa variety is known as munco. Claudio Corrado uses smaller cocoa fruit than the larger companies, an old variety that hasn't been domesticated, with a smaller yield and more taste. The harvest is finished now. Trees are bare and the stores are full. That's how it looks inside. You take all this out. What's the white stuff? That's the flesh of the fruit. Can I try it? Sure. To see what a cocoa bean looks like, where it comes from, this is exciting for me. I wouldn't have expected it to be like this. The idea that this cocoa bean should end up as a bar of chocolate, so interesting. At first sight, you don't even see that it's a plantation, due to these big trees planted everywhere to provide shade. Fruit trees, big ochre trees, all kinds of trees. For a layman like me, it looks like a primeval forest. However, Nick is not about to reveal the secret of what might be the best chocolate in the world. The choice of cocoa plant, the handiwork, the attention to detail. Ultimately, these are people who are not satisfied with something mediocre. Hmm? Here we select the cocoa beans. First, second, and third class. This is the first class, and this is the second. But what happens during the fermentation? The beans are turned over continuously until they're ready for drying. Through heat treatment? No, time takes care of that. What's it like living on Principe? Well, life is difficult here. Principe suffers because of its double isolation. It's 150 kilometers away from Sao Tome and about 350 kilometers from the continent. 
e a cerca de 350 km do continente. Então, Do you prefer é living on Príncipe ou São Tomé? Me? Well, I'm happier here, of course. But both islands are a part of us. We're here right now, but next thing we're over there. Anyway, I believe Príncipe will soon be one of the most popular islands in the world. This isn't the case for now. Príncipe is nice and quiet. Even in the capital, many streets are empty. At first glance, Príncipe seems almost deserted. But it's just slow, much quieter than São Tomé. Far fewer people, of course. An unbelievably lush and fertile. I think I like Príncipe even more than São Tomé. Hello. Is this the photographers? Could you take my picture? Just as I am? Then I'd like to have my photo taken. We're in the same business, by the way. What kind of photos do you take? Photos for documents, full body, postcard format, or passport photos? Great. How did you become a photographer? Becoming a photographer wasn't my idea at all. The owner of this shop asked me. I was working in a computer school, teaching computer science. And he was looking for someone who was familiar with the Photoshop program. Very good. I think this is the real African soul here. Colorful, lush and beautiful. And very funny for Europeans. I'm sitting in this pleasure garden with a little kitten, surrounded by a kind of garland with doves and hearts. And that's what you actually see every day. The women have these colorful dresses on, and everything's lush, bright and beautiful. And they want this in their photos as well, because it's part of them. But they don't try to put in a cool background like we would in Europe, something spaced out or whatever, because here, coolness and status are different things. Oh, very, very good. With this lawn down here. Thanks a lot. See you again. Ruiz got hundreds of photos on his hard disk. He has to start sorting out his material to find out what motifs he still needs. The people here have this very relaxed facial expression without trying to exhibit anything, just showing themselves as they are. I photographed this small girl at school. She put her hands on her hips. Look at the way she stands there, so straight and so elegant. Here we have two friends I photographed. I rarely get something so natural and relaxed. And here it's everywhere. I also like to give people the opportunity to show themselves however they want to, without starting out trying to direct them in any way, because then I would lose so much. So I get a lot that wouldn't have occurred to me at all. This 
dieser, dieser Stolz und diese Würde, das findet man This bei pride and dignity. You find it in adults, but also in children. This applies to their posture. Unbelievable posture. You could almost believe it's the result of training. But when you ask men, young girls, children to just stand there, then they stand there so naturally and with such elegance. It's something I've hardly ever seen in Europe. All that I seem to be missing now are landscape shots. That's my goal for the next few days. One of the most beautiful beaches on Principe is the Praia Banana. Ten years ago, a famous advert was filmed here. Rui, who also does a lot of work in advertising, wants to shoot a few atmospheric beach photos today. But the weather won't play along. The sun is an essential part of a photo like this. I don't think I've ever seen a perfect beach photo without sunshine. And when you travel, you don't always get sunshine. Like today, and I still think the beach is beautiful, even without the postcard finish. For the book, Rui wants to show everything as it really is. But for an advertising job, he often has to work with other means. Nobody wants to see a cloudy beach in a brochure. Coconuts, tree trunks, leaves, whatever are airbrushed out. The beach is made a bit whiter, the sky a bit bluer. The water too, everything is made perfect. Maybe these beaches exist, and you're lucky enough to end up on a beach on which everything happens to be perfect, but beaches don't really look like that. When he was coming in to land on Principe, Rui saw that the island presented a very promising motif from above. Today, he's going to risk another flight next to the open door. The challenge in taking aerial photos is presented by the light. So you have to be in the air at the right time. It can't be too misty or too cloudy, but the sun can't be too bright either. And you need a plane that's not flying too fast. The pilot also has to know how to get close to the island or the mountains so that they can be photographed, keeping the wings out of the shot, having the right angle to the sun. From above, Principe looks like a mixture of Jurassic Park and a cursed pirate island. The island is very small, but from above you see all these pointed hills and steep cliffs with a jungle in between and few houses. The island looks almost untouched from above. Beautiful beaches, but no people on them. Now and then a few fishing boats. It looks phenomenal from above. Principe has kept its charm, because there's hardly any tourism and no industry. However, a few years ago, crude oil was discovered in the Gulf of Guinea. There's no telling what changes this will bring to the two islands. Back on the island of Sao Tome, Rui goes to see a performance of the Chiloli Theater. All the roles are played by men. The actors are farmers and fishermen in real life, but once a year, they take on the roles of French nobility from the Middle Ages.
Chiloli Theater is unique in Africa. It's about a murder. Prince Valdivinos has been killed. The dance theater is built around a court case dealing with a grisly deed. Chiloli is the name in the local dialect for the tragedy of the Marquis de Mantua and Emperor Charlemagne. It is not about our culture, it's about European culture. The tragedy of the Marquis de Mantua is a true story that took place in the 16th century. Prince Carlotto killed a friend during a hunting trip because he loved the man's wife. Now he's on trial in court. His father, Charlemagne, has to judge his own son. The Chiloni groups always put on this one play. The actors always play the same roles, keep them their whole lives, and pass them on to their descendants. The content and the figures in the story are European, but the Santomians have added their own music and their traditional dances to the play. The play came to Sao Tome in the 16th century. It was brought here by the people who built the sugar mills. Then it moved on to Brazil and we modified it in our own way. It is a very old tradition. The older people who started it up are still sitting here. Last week we had our anniversary. Our group has been going on for 55 years. The people really like it, they love it. Slaves copied the play from their Portuguese masters and kept changing it until it became something completely new. Today, it's staged in the village square on special occasions, and it's four hours long. Sometimes the audience wants scenes to be repeated. Then, it can even run for five or six hours. For the actors, the performance is a real endurance test in the great heat. The clothes are heavy and dark, and you're wearing a lot. Isn't it too hot when the sun is shining so much? It's our duty, so we have to put it on. You have to endure it four hours. Four hours. But we drink palm wine now and then, our traditional refreshment. But then we're OK. Is there a break? No. Four hours without a break. The Chiloli Theatre is always changing. It refers to current affairs and politics, and this keeps it alive for its audience. Before it's time to go home, Rui wants to photograph one last important subject. Football plays a major role on Sao Tome and Principe. Every Sunday, the beach in the town is turned into a stadium. The sidelines are the sea on one side and a wall on the other. Nobody is too particular about the details. Fun and passion are more important in the local league than having a real stadium. Rui has gotten used to the fact that not everything is perfect on the two tropical islands. He has grown very fond of the slightly morbid charm here. Rui is back in the south of the island. Today, he's opening the exhibition with his pupils' photographs in the local market hall. Joao the cook is also happy that so many photos have been taken. I've been given a lot of praise for the photos hanging here. Many people have come up to me and said, you've taken some super photos, really great. And I've had to tell them that it wasn't me who took them, but it was their children. 
Then there are amazement, puzzled faces, and after that, pride. Oh, we did this, you know, we. They didn't even say, our children did this, but rather, we took these photos. And that makes me happy. This acceptance I had hoped to find you. I think that's something you usually don't get. People usually only see that they've been photographed, but they never get to see the photo. And now they're really amazed that there's an exhibition with their photos in it. The whole town is delighted with it. I'm very happy. You promise us that you'll come back someday? I gladly promise that. I'll definitely come back. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you, that we can keep the cameras to carry on your work. I want to thank you for letting me do all this. I couldn't have done it without your help. Yes, but I think we both want to make something happen and to make the people a little happier with small things. The rainy season is beginning on Sao Tome and Principe, and Rui starts out for home. In his luggage, countless images and unforgettable impressions. <laughs>